and welcome. Um, Pat Murphy is going to do the introductions. Here, I'm Deirdre Byrne, and I'll see you later. Okay, <clears throat> and thanks very much, Deirdre. And uh, hello and welcome to these first of uh, four events on key periods uh, in Irish development, seen through its history and writing. Uh, it's great to see, uh, see you. Well, I can't actually see you. I can see you in my mind's eye, um, and I know you're there. Um, and this event is organised jointly by Five Leaves and the Nottingham Irish Studies Group. Five Leaves is Nottingham's award-winning independent bookshop, and the shop itself is open and uh, it's also online at the moment. Uh, can I just say we're not charging for these uh, sessions? But we ask you to think about making a contribution to Emmanuel House, which for many years has worked with homeless people and no more than ever needs uh, your support. So tonight I'm going to start with a short description of the historical and political context uh, of the Irish famine, which began in 1845. Deirdre Byrne then will talk about some of the writing about the, the famine, including Jonathan Swift's uh, satire, A Modest Proposal, which of course was written long before the famine and mocked, mocked uh, heartless attitudes to the poor. There will be time for a, a question and answer session at the end. Um, and if you have questions during the session, please uh, enter them on the Q&A button at the bottom right hand side of the screen. Um, okay, so since the start of the pandemic, We've heard a lot about um, how great emergencies, great crises like these, uh, expose the underlying, <clears throat> the underlying inequalities in society. But in Ireland in the 1840s, the underlying inequalities uh, in that society didn't need to be exposed because they were on, uh, on view to anybody who took the time to see. And between 1800 and 1840, there had been literally dozens of inquiries, including royal commissions into the state of Ireland. And in 1845, a potato blight arrived in Ireland for, from, from North America. And the nature of Irish rural society, especially in the West and the Southwest, made Ireland particularly vulnerable to this blight. Most of Irish land was owned by Anglo-Irish landlords at the time, including people like Lord Lucan, who owned the vast estate in the west of Ireland. And Lord Lucan and some of these landlords would visit these estates only once or twice uh, in a lifetime. Um, there were three areas which, of, of concern which were thrown up by all these uh, inquiries and royal commissions. The first one was population growth. And the population of Ireland had doubled in 40 years between the start of the 19th century and the next census in 1841, which was uh, the population of Ireland at the time was 8.2 million. The other area of concern was the subdivision of land. And this was closely linked to the population explosion. Most rural Irish um, uh, were tenant farmers living on small holdings of between five and 15 acres, very small plots of land. And as the population expanded, tenants subdivided these plots into even smaller holdings. This was also connected to the third area of concern, which was the over-reliance on the potato, which was known in England as the lazy crop and 40% of the population, almost 3 million people, lived on potatoes alone. Potatoes were cheap, they were uh, provided a reasonably balanced diet. People could actually live on them uh, without any other form of food. Uh, and an average male um, would eat between 10 to 15 pounds of potatoes in a day. But as well as this dire poverty in the, in the West and Southwest of Ireland, there was also um, a thriving economy. And in a sense, a subsistence and a commercial economy lived side by side. The economy, two thirds of all agricultural produce uh, produced in Ireland was exported. Cattle, butter, 
Uh, most of the corn used in Great Britain at the time was imported from Ireland. Ireland was known as the granary of Great Britain at the time. And there had been famines in the past um, caused by potato blight, but nothing on, on, the, um, on the scale of what happened in 1845. And the reason for that, in past famines, there had been a diversity of food, including grain and corn. Um, but in the 40 years before the famine, uh, the potato had become the sole uh, food for literally millions of people. The blights first hit in 1845 and one third of the crop failed. It came across North America um, and spores of the blight were carried by the wind and the rain. And when the potato was picked out of the ground initially, it looked fine, it looked okay, it was solid uh, and healthy. But after a short period in storage, the potato began to turn into a soft, putrid black mass. And this was devastating for, for the whole of Ireland. In 1846, uh, an even worse blight hit the potato crop and about two thirds of the crop failed. The <clears throat> government at the time was a Tory government led by Sir Robert Peel. And Peel's government, initially in 1845 and the beginning of 1846, uh, mitigated the effects of the famine pretty effectively. But his government fell in um, June 1846 after his repeal of the Corn Laws. And a new Whig government under Lord John Russell um, came into power. And Russell had, an, had a, a reputation as being a social reformer. He was instrumental in the Reform Act of 1832. But his government was, was dominated by an ideology called political economy. And this was a form of free market fundamentalism. The invisible hand of the market should not be interfered with, interfered with whatever the cost. And this chimed with prejudiced and racist views of the Catholic Irish as a feckless, treacherous and barbarous people. These were views that were held um, by at least part of the English uh, population for uh, centuries. But although the, the imperative of the government, of Russell's government, was to avoid in, interfering with the market, and this determined the response to the famine, they put this aside, they put this imperative aside um, when they found it politically expedient. For instance, in 1847, at the height of the Irish famine, there was an economic slump in the north of England, and thousands of mill workers were thrown out of, out of work. Um, but the government intervened vigorously. They gave loans to the uh, loans and grants to the uh, employers, and even um, even gave some support to the unemployed workers. And this was um, justified by the press, especially as the deserving poor. These were people they said who had been thrown out of work through no fault of their own. And this was contrasted with the, um, with the undeserving poor in Ireland. Irish peasants, feckless, lazy Irish peasants, constantly demanding relief. The other thing the government realized at, at the, the time, this particular government, was that a good crisis should not be wasted. And that the famine would bring about the kind of social and economic for, uh, reforms and changes that they had been on the, unable to impose. These reforms were a culling of the population through debt and emigration, a change from um, tillage to pasture farming, in other words, from potato crops um, to uh, cattle farming, and an end to the subdivision of farms. The uh, response of the government was pitifully short of what was necessary. Cheap Indian corn was made available at market prices, but those in need had to work on a system of outdoor relief to earn money to buy it. The 
priority was that indolence should not be re re rewarded and the dependence on the state should be avoided at all costs. And I wonder where we've heard that recently. But for me, one policy illustrates uh, the government response to the famine in all its awful detail. Uh, and this is famine roads. Uh, next slide, Pippa, please. These roads were part of a big public works program developed by the government with the sole intent of ensuring that weak and starving people did not also become indolent and dependent on the state. Famine roads, and you can still see some of these famine roads around the west of Ireland today. Famine roads were roads which were, which were made to go nowhere with no other purpose than to make sure that thousands of people who were already weakened by starvation and disease should work rather than receive handouts. And this in the middle of the terrible winter of 1847 for the pittance they were paid. And these efforts proved to be so ineffective that free rations were distributed uh, towards the end of 1847. These rations were then withdrawn and the government made it clear that the relief effort would now have to be borne by landlords, local relief committees and charities. One of the consequences of this was that evictions increased when landlords were made to take responsibility for tenants. Next slide, Pippa, please. I feel a bit like Chris Whitty saying this, ne next slide. Um, so the number of uh, families evicted uh, in 1847 was at 6,000. And you can see the gradual increase in evictions. Um, and this was also part of the uh, government um, attempt to re reconstruct and reorient society. By 1851, they had almost, they had more than doubled. The government received, <coughs> refused to redistribute food. And during the famine, over 4,000 ships left Irish ports with corn and other foodstuffs, um, for, mostly for England. The man who could be considered, I suppose, most responsible for the, um, the government response to the famine was Sir Charles Trevelyan. Next slide, Pippa, please. <clears throat> who was Assistant uh, Secretary to the Treasury. And he wrote an article at the height of the famine and applauded the fact that starvation encouraged migration and supported the view that God was punishing Irish Catholics for their superstitious ways and adherence to proper to popery. The real evil, he said, with which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the people. And Sir Charles Trevelyan was knighted by Queen Victoria that same year for his work on the famine. Next slide, Pippa, please. Um, so you can see here the number of excess debts um, in the, due to the famine. Um, 1847, almost 250,000. Uh, it dipped uh, in 1848, but rose again in 1849. And in 1849, the reason for this was an outbreak of cholera which got into workhouses where there were thousands of people. And we know from this pandemic what happens when a very contagious disease gets into <clears throat> a place where there's lots of vulnerable people. So the consequences of the famine, next slide please, um, is that the population fell uh, from 8.2 million in 1841 to 6.6 .6 million in 1851. So somewhere between one and one and a half million people died as a result of the famine and about a million more probably emigrated. By 1901 in the 60 years uh, from 1841 to 1901, um, the population fell by almost a half. Uh, 
some of the other consequences. Um, yeah, next please, next slide please. Um, Irish immigration um, during the famine years, yeah, over one million uh, left the country. And this changed not only the character of Ireland, but it changed the character of lots of uh, British cities, including Nottingham, and lots of American cities. Um, some of the other consequences, next slide please, uh, was that the famine greatly increased the power of the Catholic Church, the Irish language declined, um, and there was an increase in the class of strong farmers um, who bought out tenant farmers, and this stopped the subdivision of land. The farmers now passed their land onto the eldest son, and the other offsprings were expected to either seek employment or emigrate, and this changed Irish society very much. The famine also reinforced the view of many Irish people that Britain was unfit to govern Ireland and that the link must be broken. Next slide, please. The prominent um, Irish nationalist, um, and I think uh, people of Deirdre and I's generation, if we remembered one thing about the famine, we would remember this quote from John Mitchell. The Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created a famine. And while this may have been true up to a point, I think it's unfair to the many millions of English people who vigorously opposed the um, policy of the government at the time and uh, supported relief efforts in Ireland. In 1851, a government inquiry came to the conclusion that the level of suffering was unacceptable in Ireland and queried whether a similar level of death and starvation would have been allowed in any other part of the United Kingdom. And the famine for many proved beyond doubt that Ireland was not an equal part of the UK, but an internal colony. And it changed the course of Irish history and historians now talk about before uh, Ireland before the famine and Ireland after the famine. So I'm now going to pass over to Deirdre, who's going to talk about um, the literature relating to the famine. And I'm sure most of you know Deirdre, who teaches literature at Loughborough University and has written widely on Irish literature and Irish writers. And through the Nottingham Irish Studies Group has run numerous events relating to Irish literature, language, politics and history. Over to you, Deirdre. Thanks, Pat. I give a very uh, slim um, introduction to you. Um, Pat's a historian and he specialises in the period we're dealing with next week, which is 1916. But uh, as with any history, you can't really deal with history, especially in Ireland, without looking backwards. So I'm going to step backwards into the 18th century now and think about Jonathan Swift. My main question in thinking about Swift in relation to the famine is, does satire work? Can you attack those in power? And um, also, um, you know, what was the, the legacy that he left behind him? So a modest proposal, this uh, document was published in 1729. And the second um, document I'll be drawing on is this book here, The Hungry Voice by Christopher Morash. And um, Morash has collected poetry from, the, poetry from the Irish famine itself. Um, why do we call it the great hunger? Because there were so many famines and hunger beforehand. So the period that Jonathan Swift is talking about in 1729, it's very clear from everything he says in the modest proposal, the people in Ireland were starving then and he knew about it. Um, next slide, Pippa. Thanks. Who was he? He was born in Dublin into the Anglo-Irish ruling class, so he was one of the gentry himself. He was Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral, Dublin, um, until he died in 1745, um, for quite some years. Best known as author of Gulliver's Travels, which is still widely read. He was a clergyman, he was a novelist, he was a poet. For our purposes, we're mostly looking at his essay which is satirical which is a modest proposal right next slide 
Here he says, and this is not Swift himself, a modest proposal is an act of ventriloquism. You can read it all online. It's well out of copyright that he's long since dead. Um, it's about four pages of A4 if you want to print it out. There's a link at the end of the slides. But basically his speaker says he has been assured that a young healthy child is at about one year old, a most delicious and nourishing food. So however you cook it, it'll be good for eating. And um, this is the nub of his what he's proposing. There are a few pages before that where he's leading up to it, but this is the suggestion itself. And he goes on, the speaker, to suggest that the surplus children, so you know, not all the children, but the surplus children might, as one-year-old, be offered in sale to the persons of quality. So we get this sense of us and them. Which side the speaker is on, we'll find out shortly. Next slide. What are the advantages of this suggestion, of this proposal? Um, the market value, and as Pat was talking about the merchant class, it was a very important part of the economy. Um, dealing, buying, selling, and all the rest of it, when isn't it? Um, population. His first point, this speaker is saying, it will greatly lessen the number of papists. So, you know, they're having too many babies. The other concern of that class was that they're not just breeding babies, they're breeding sedition because these, some of these babies are rebels or grow up to be rebels. The poor tenants will have something valuable of their own. What you can see from Swift's document is that he actually knew a lot about how the peasants were living. He might have been based in Dublin and actually for a lot of his life he was living in England, but he did as a clergyman have a lot of sympathy and I know I'm not saying all clergymen are sympathetic towards the poor, but he certainly knew a lot of their plight. He wasn't just one of these guys that stuck up in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. He knew what was going on. He knew the poor attendants couldn't pay their rent. So the speaker goes on to say that um, child rearing is expensive and it actually names um, a sum of money, how much it costs. And here we find out who the speaker is. Well, the poor will save money if they can sell babies. Where will the money go? The money will circulate among ourselves. So in other words, the poor will save money on child rearing. They'll be able to pay their rent. It'll come back to us, the landed gentry. I have to emphasize this is not Swift. It's his speaker. Um, as now, people are worried about business in taverns and inns. This new food, inns, of course, would be serving food. They wouldn't have been wet pubs, as we say now. We've learned the difference between wet and dry pubs. Um, it would bring custom to taverns. It would be an inducement to marriage. Why? Because it would be like keeping a mare that was in foal or a cow in calf. Um, you want to hold on to this breeding um, um, female and you would marry her rather than just impregnate her. Um, it would reduce domestic violence. He said husbands would not be violent to their uh, wives because for fear of miscarriage, and he actually uses that word in the text, miscarriage. A baby's flesh would taste better than bacon. He mentions other food, um, but he, the speaker is putting forward um, this idea that it'll help economically but it'll also be a tasty dish. Um, it's about quality of life, as they say. Right, next slide. Was Swift joking here? You know, what's his viewpoint? Well, look at his other writings. This is 1725. The proposal was written in 1729. He's writing to his fellow satirist, his fellow writer, indeed, Alexander Pope. The chief end I propose to myself in all my labours, so that my chief aim in my writings is to vex the world rather than divert it. He is trying to annoy his readers, to poke at them, not just to amuse them. It's not just a diversion here. So he does have a serious point, as indeed Alexander Pope did in a lot of his writings. If we look at his, um, well, another speaker, he, a character he creates in the novel Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver says, poor nations are hungry, rich nations are proud. Pride and hunger will ever be at variance. In other words, 
at odds. You get a lot of consciousness in Swift of us and them. Poor nations, clearly Ireland is one of those. Rich nations, England, they're proud. They're proud. Pride and hunger. You know, we're talking about the pride of what would they go on to call empire. Um, the hungry peasant is at variance with the well-off. Right, next slide, please. Right, did satire work? Well, if we drag ourselves now a hundred years later after Swift's death, what kind of effect did he have? It's not that his document vanished, it's still out there, it's still read, it's still studied. It was wonderfully um, popular. But, you know, the people that he was aiming at, those people in power, where are they listening? Well, let's, let's look at the Hungry Voices collected by Morash here. These are taken from pamphlets, from, um, from newspapers at the time, from ballad sheets and so on, and collected in this wonderful resource published by Irish Academic Press, who gave me permission here uh, to quote from it. Um, Morash has, pub, or has divided it helpfully into eight sections. Um, and I have taken one title um, from each section. Now, I'm not going to read them all out, but if you look at the ejected tenant, desolation, funerals, extermination, which actually was a code word for um, evictions, because if you evict a person, you might as well be exterminating. Woeful, um, emigration, mortality, and farewell. Um, look at the names as well. The West, as Pat said, the West was very badly hit. Um, Skibbereen down in Pat's area of the country, actually, down Cork. Donegal, right at the north tip, again, the west. But the west is very beautiful, it still is. But as they say, you can't eat scenery. Um, next, we're in, next slide. Right, let's look specifically at some of the language. A very large section of Morash's collection is dealing with the religious response. And well, in the 19th century, if people had could afford a book and had one book in the house, that book would be the Bible. But um, whatever your religion, um, people tended to be God-fearing and, uh, you know, um, of, of um, religious persuasion. Um, Aubrey de Vere here is writing in 1849 and Morash puts this forward as what he's um, suggesting is there's some kind of sanctity or holiness to suffering. Now in my day my mother would have said offer it up and this is the attitude indeed here. If you're suffering, offer it to God, it's God's will. From ruined huts and holes come forth, all men and look at you on yonder sky. The power divine is on the earth. Give thanks to God before ye die. Um, it is quite grim, his calling on these men to come out and think about God, give thanks, but they're going to die. Notice the Irish idiom there, ye die. But they are living in ruined huts and holes. They were actually um, journalistic um, newspaper reports of the Irish being in holes in the ground because some of them were evicted, some of them they couldn't pay the rent and so on. Uh, I found the Miro poem interesting because it's calling on St. Patrick. Um, 1847, known as Black 47, because one it was the worst year of the famine. Our island saint, our glorious saint, O oh, lift thy hands on high and pray for us, asking Patrick to intercede for us. But it is saying we, sh we still shall bow submissively beneath the scourging rod and we'll still pray our Father's prayer, which of course is Lord's prayer, but we will still call out glory be to God. There was a lot of this response that people were um writing. We have to think about who was writing these poems. Um, well, it's not going to be the starving peasants themselves, is it? If you can't afford food, you cannot afford paper, you can't afford newspapers. These are the better off people. They mightn't be the landed gentry and, you know, certainly lots of them weren't. Um, moving on, Pippa, please. Was there any help for them? 
Well, you might think, why didn't they go to the workhouse? Why didn't they go to the poorhouse? And this poorhouse and workhouse system, it was more commonly called the poorhouse in Ireland. The workhouse system was set up over here in England first. And um, the intent was that they would make it quite a challenging environment because it wasn't meant to be enticing people to be lazy and come in and the workhouse will look after you. What they intended was that the workhouse will be um, harder than living outside to encourage people go and get a job and so on. The problem was when they set up the workhouses in Ireland, the planners themselves admitted the standard of the Irish mode of living is unhappily so low that the establishment of one still lower is difficult. In other words, you can't make the workhouse more challenging because outside is so awful. It's so bad. The other thing um, they were saying, able bodied people should go out and work. And lots of people said, as Pat said, lots of these people were sympathetic towards the starving poor. Lots of people pointed out um, there is no work. There's no work for them. Um, if you went into the workhouse, if you were lucky, well, lucky enough, it's questionable, because if you went in there, what would you get? Death, death, death inside of the workhouse. There's lots of starvation um, outside, but there's disease, typhoid, cholera, famine, fever, as, as they called it, inside. The irony that this is called the song of the famine. Um, some of the sources here, Dublin University Magazine, Irish Catholic Magazine, Cork Magazine, The Nation, which is a, a nationalist newspaper. Um, next, not everybody was religious. Religion or resistance? Well, if this is your choice, this is what Thomas Darcy McGee says, swear by the four winds of heaven. Now, you might see that as religious. You might see it as um, apocalyptic. You might indeed see it as pagan, depending on where you're coming from. He says, swear that the land shall be saved and its tyrants outdriven. Do it and blessings will chant to your grave. Not just offer it up, you'll be blessed, but, you know, fight. Um, swear that you'll fight the tyrants. God has been bountiful. Will you be brave? Harvest him. The harvest had become a kind of a code word because it was well known that the insurgents at this stage um, in the 1840s, they were planning a rising, uh, those who were well enough to do it, but uh, they wanted to wait till after the harvest. So, you know, of, of, of fruit and all the rest of it. Um, so there, there was some food there. And indeed, as lots of people say, we'd call this the great hunger rather than the great famine because there was food, there was corn, it was being exported. Um, but obviously not everybody starved to death because I'm still here and, you know, some of our antecedents um, lived on. Um, the personification of death that we saw, that goes on and on um, in, in the, the, slide, uh, the, the poems. Um, next poem, or next slide, yeah. Right, here, some of the themes that come up, as Pat said, eviction, emigration, politics. A lot of them deal with the figure of the woman. Now, this goes way back in Ireland, looking at Ireland herself as a female, Kathleen O'Hulahan, the old woman of the roads, that it's a metaphor. But also, of course, there were real women who were dying. This poem tells the story of a grandmother, and she's got um, a, a pure and innocent uh, granddaughter alongside her. But here, somebody is writing about a wretched quilt and bed of straw and famine fever. Um, there's a sense of us and them here, but not at all the kind of us and them that Swift has been pointing out. We're on the other side now, we're on the side of the peasants. A band of ruffians burst in the door. So the violence here, who are they coming from? The ruthless landlord. And, and they're attempting to clear the rightful owners of the land. The eviction written by Michael Seagrave here, we know he was from County Loud in Drogheda. He went to work as a weaver. The weavers um, in uh, the North and Midlands were quite politicised. He became a chartist, an early trade unionist. Um, you can find out one of the chartist leaders is Fergus O'Connor. He has a Nottingham link. I'm not going to go into it now, but, um, you know, there were chartists who were Irish. Um, 
interestingly, this, this after he left, this went on having a life of its own in Ireland because Ralph Averian collected it in 1877 in his ballads, popular poets, poetry and household songs. Um, there are brilliant notes at the end of Morash's book. Um, there's notes on all the poems, pages of notes. Next slide. Okay, moving on, and I know that's been a really um, a quick gallop through the poetry of the time. Um, this has lived on, as we all know, the famine, the great hunger has lived on to the present day. Um, do we have proof of this? Yes. Ivan Boland, who died recently, a wonderful poet, has written about the famine and her poem Quarantine, it's one of the favourite poems of Russ Ross Bradshaw, who owns Five Leaves Bookshop, Five Leaves Publisher. This was shortlisted for a poem for Ireland a few years ago. She's also written The Famine Road and other poems. I've written a little bit about this in a book actually edited by Ross, published by Five Leaves. Um, Seamus Heaney, Desmond Egan and others have written about the famine. I've given links where you can find some of these resources from Dublin City University. DCU also provides some songs. You may be familiar with Pete Sinjin's song, The Fields of Athen Rye, sung at sporting events and actually all kinds of events. Um, and there is a cultural memory of the famine that lives on with us. You might think that that Fields of Athen Rye, the language he's used, he mentions Trevelyan's corn. Um, there's a couple who are split up because of it. He writes in the language of old folk songs, but you can read more about that on Peach St. John's site. Um, very quickly, the last slide, I've just tried to move it on myself. Um, these are some of the sources. So if you want to look them up, you can. I've named the poems. There are many, many poems here and the notes are wonderful. Um, you can, if you like, listen to Swift's A Modest Proposal because LibriVox has uh, speakers reading it aloud. I would recommend it actually because the 18th century language can be a little un inaccessible on the page, but do have a look for um, this book. It's terrific. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have questions, we'll have a look at them now in the Q&A box. Could I ask you a question, Pat, as we're here? Um, are, did you work on um, the nation as a background to any of the historical work you were doing? Were you looking at that as a voice at all? At, at the famine? <clears throat> yeah, did you come across the fact that this was such a strong voice? Because lots and lots and lots of the poems I noticed were coming from it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the famine, as I was saying, I think historians see Ireland before the famine and after the famine, but it had, it had a, a, a real, I think, um, uh, effect on what happened afterwards. I mean, most of, of what we now call the revolutionary generation, you know, the people who yeah. fought in the War of Independence, um, their parents would have, um, would have lived through the famine, at least some of them. I mean, Michael Collins, for instance, uh, grew up in Clonakilty in West Cork. And Clonakilty, even when I was growing up, was, was still called Clonakilty, God help us, yeah. because, because, of the, um, because of the number of deaths and, and that was really hit hard. And, and Colin's father grew up in that period and he would have kind of imbibed that with his mother's milk, I think, the, um, the effect um, of, of the famine. Um, and, you know, with Mitchell's famous quote about uh, the Almighty sent the blight, but the English gave us the famine. That was, I think, um, I think, I think very, very important in terms of what happened, uh, what happened later. Yeah, as I thought that's about the legacy in the literature, um, I, the old woman that turns up here again and again and the old man but particularly the old woman because in those songs like about the four green fields and the rest of us um that it lives on in folk song it lives on in folk memory and you know and people like yates of course and pierce as we'll be looking at took up some of the um uh, some of those themes. There are questions coming in. The effects of the famine still felt today. 
Um, well, do you want to ha talk about a little bit more about that pass or? Um, well, I think the effects are, are, are the way Irish society developed. Yeah. So, um, as I was saying, I, I think the, the Catholic Church was greatly consolid consolidated its position after that, mostly through education. You know, Catholic schools, Catholic church, there was a huge um, explosion of, of Catholic buildings around the country, churches, schools, um, and um, yeah, I, I think the, the other thing, of course, was, was immigration. And as I was saying, I think that changed not only Ireland forever, but it also changed, um, it, it, it changed Britain, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Josie, it's a good question because um, late marriage uh, became a thing. I mean, before, as Pat says, the land could be divided up. If you had 10 children, a plot could be divided into 10. After the famine, and I'm a farmer's daughter here, um, the land would be given to one of the children. I'm not debasing that, but this is a, a market effect of the, the famine. Thus, they stopped dividing up the land. There was kind of a loss of trust in, in um, even in the potato and the land itself. I mean, the, and the other thing that I think has come out of it is we have an emotional connection to the land. Um, it, it's, it's become, you can see it in one of the poems, there's a capital L for land. Part of that is to do with, you know, less standardized spelling and the rest of us. But we really do have an emotional connection to it in Ireland. Um, so one son typically would inherit, but the late marriage, oh yeah, um, they, they, the Catholic Church took a hand in this as well, but they, they would breed later, if you like, and they would breed increasingly inside marriage, as Swift was pointing out in his satire. Um, some of them didn't bother getting married, you know. I know we're changing back now, but there was became more emphasis on having children inside marriage and putting off marriage until later. So obviously the population, you wouldn't have as many children if you're going to get married. Were there any landlords as well as the Anglo-Irish? I think that there were quite a lot of uh, Irish landlords. Um, not so much before the famine, but certainly after the famine as, as, uh, as things changed. And there was something called the uh, Encumbered Estates, Estates Act came in in uh, 1848, which um, more or less forced some of the uh, Anglo-Irish landlords to sell. Um, and I think the thing we often forget is that there was a great deal of contempt in England as well for Anglo-Irish landlords. Um, many people over here felt that they didn't take responsibility either for their estates or for their, um, or for, or for their land, for their tenants. Um, but after, after the famine, um, things changed fairly quickly. And as I was saying, this class, new class of strong farmers um, uh, came in and started buying up uh, land in great uh, numbers. But, <clears throat> I mean, the, um, the, the other fact, I think, is that some Irish merchants and some Irish farmers also did very well over the famine. I talked about how much corn and how much food produce was exported to England. Um, and a lot of this was, was done by... Um, by Catholic Irish merchants and farmers. Yeah, and um, you know, even before the famine, you get uh, Mariah Edgeworth in 1801 in um, uh, Castle Rackrent, um, that there's some collusion going on between the, the Irish, the, the Gambian men, the kind of market, you know, there's always going to be people who are profiting as indeed is the conversation now, who's profiting from what we're going through. Somebody asked the question, um, Dale, was the hunger total? Actually, um, 
it was a surprise to me when I went to the Dublin archives because uh, um, <laughs> ridiculously, when I think about it, I went into the archives for County Carla looking for O'Burns and O'Tools, my relatives, as the names themselves suggested, from County Wicklow. Um, so I didn't find people mentioning, you know, people I might have recognised. I was very surprised to find how bad it was there because I really had the perception that it there were just pockets and the West was worse. Well, yes, it certainly was worse, but um, I was able to handle these letters and, um, uh, you know, um, doctors and religious people writing letters to uh, people saying, there's no point in offering um, seed for sale and corn for sale. These people have no money to buy us. They're starving people all around us and saying that when I'm trying to collect money by subscription, as they call it, donations, in other words, it's the kind of middle people that are giving it, not the gentry. So not the upper classes, but, uh, you know, people with some money are being very generous and really helping the peasants. But, uh, you know, that's what I know from County Carroll, the second smallest uh, county in Ireland. It's um, it's great farming country, actually. It's, you know, it's good land, but they were starving. Pass? Any... What do you think? Oh, can you see the questions? Was the hunger total? Was it just Sligo took over in large pockets? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I don't think it was. I, I don't think it was total. Um, I think probably Mayo, Donegal, um, certainly parts of Kerry and Cork were hit the hit the hardest. Um, and again, it depended on on some estates. Uh, you know, you had vast estates like Lord Lucan uh, in in uh, in County Mayo, which were pretty underdeveloped and. Uh, these middlemen, these agents, were allowed to run these estates with very little, um, with very little so, uh, supervision from from the uh, the landowners. Um, but there were other estates which were uh, quite progressive, um, and the land, of course, also changed. Um, so no, it it, it wasn't. Uh, I don't think it was a total um, blight on the whole west coast, but it was certainly in the West Coast where it hit most. And I think it's also worth, worth remembering that there were outbreaks of blight all over Europe around this period because yeah. um, the, the potato blight travelled across North America and uh, quickly travelled around Europe. But it was only in Ireland really where there was this awful catastrophic famine. We're going to have to take the last question. So very quickly, um, the willful blindness and denial among the English about the famine, is it even taught in schools? Um, if you remember the programme that was on, um, something about Queen Victoria getting, I can't remember the name of the programme now. I just remember a kind of a fuss all of a sudden on social media that we didn't know about this and coming from English people. I think, well, why didn't you know about it? The information is out there. But, you know, obviously it was taught to us in school. I suppose that's my history. I don't know either. But it's it certainly, um, I heard a great talk by Carol Leeming yesterday on Black British history. And one of the things she pointed out is the silence around colonialism in schools. And Ireland is one facet of that. There's been a big silence. Do you think, Pat, before we wrap up? Well, absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, it, it's it's not only silence on that. I think it's a silence on a lot of uh, um, a lot of Irish history. Cromwell, for instance, and um, what happened. I think we'll be talking next week a little bit about <clears throat> the Home Rule Crisis of 1914. You know, um, very little, very few people in England have been uh, taught about that in in, in history in school. Um, but the other part of silence, I think, is that. Um, the, generate, the couple of generations that came after the famine, uh, I think were very reluctant even to talk about it. Yeah. It left a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder in the whole country. Um, a sense of shame almost that, uh, that they, had, they had endured this. Um, so as well as the great hunger, I suppose, there was, there was also the great silence to some extent. And there is that book about it called The Great Shame. So, yes, 
thanks very much for everybody who came and thank you very much for Pat who set up the Nottingham Irish Studies Group way back in 1991. It's made a huge difference to my life actually. Um, thanks everyone, I hope you join talking about the fight for Irish freedom. Again, history and literature. So good night. Good night. Take care. Slow into good health. Mm -hmm.